So for this problem statement, we have determine the maximum ram force P that can be applied to the clamp at point D if the allowable normal stress for the material is 180 megapascals. So as you can see here, we have some sort of clamp and this clamp is pushing down on itself with some force P. Now we're being asked, what's the maximum force P such that the allowable stress of this device does not exceed 180 megapascals. And we see at this point we're basically being asked at section AA. So we actually have the cross section. In this case, it's kind of a T cross section with the given dimensions here. So one thing you'll notice since we have a force P, if we're focusing only on section AA, that essentially means we have an axial force P um, pulling this or trying to lengthen the, the gripper itself. So we're going to have a axial stress being developed, right? But also, since we have P um, away from this cross-sectional area, that means we're going to have a moment at this section here being produced due to that. So we have also bending stress to consider to give us the actual total stress developed in the material or in this case the maximum allowable stress which we have the given value for. So as we all know the axial stress is pretty straightforward to calculate. The bending stress you need to consider the moment the C as well as the moment of inertia. In this case, since it's dealing with multiple geometries, right? A uh, composite of geometries, you're going to be calculating the moment of inertia using the parallel axis theorem, right? Let's say this is the neutral axis approximately, and you have to solve for the, the Y bar all the way to the neutral axis Y bar. So to simplify in regards to the bending stress, are we going to consider the tensile stress or the compressive stress due to bending? Well, let me go ahead and reorient this section and draw it out just like a normal beam just to get some clarification, right? Simplify the drawings to make it easier to understand. So drawing this T-bar from the side view here, we know that we have an axial force P pulling this so we're going to have a tensile stress developed but we also have a moment as well so having this deform a bit and of course i'm exaggerating the deformation right so the top portion is going to be um, compressed right while the bottom portion is going to be in tension so in this case we know that the tensile force is going to be pulling it as well and that will add to the axial force P being applied so in this case we're going to be considering the tensile stress developed due to bending to add it up with the axial stress not the compressive stress so that's always one thing to to look out for and be careful because you could get the wrong answer. Now, in this case, due to the geometry, the neutral axis is going to be actually closer to the tension, the tensile portion of the bending due to the geometry that we have. The neutral axis is going to be closer to the bottom, right? So we're going to have a smaller C value due to that. So let me draw out the neutral axis here on this beam and we see that the C value here is going to be smaller because the neutral axis is closer towards the bottom of this beam. So that's one thing to consider, but we're going to be using the tensile stress due to bending to solve for the maximum um, P value. So for the axial stress, pretty straightforward, right? Let's go ahead and write it out in variable form since we are in fact solving for P. So, so we have P divided by the cross-sectional area, which is 0 0.001 meter squared, plus you have the bending moment times C divided by the moment of inertia, which of course in this case, since it's a composite area, we're going to be using the parallel axis theorem, and this is equivalent to the allowable axial stress given. So these are the dimensions of the T geometry here. Now, when it comes to the moment, we know it's going to be composed of P times the distance from where this P is being applied to the actual neutral axis of the cross-sectional area, right? So in this case, we first need to solve for the neutral axis. Since this geometry isn't a rectangle or something simple that the it's a 
symmetric geometry, in this case, we need to solve for the, the centroid or the Y bar for this. So let's first off go ahead and do that. So here's the equation we're going to be using for the centroid, um, the sum of each individual area centroid with respect to the, I'm using the reference point from this portion of it times the cross-sectional area divided by the sum of all the cross-sectional areas. So I'll go ahead and just plug in all the values and solve. So our, our Y bar is equal to 0 0.026 meters here. So in this case, since we have the distance from the bottom portion, right? We have the bottom portion to the force P being implied being 200 millimeters. And in this case, you, we add a 26 millimeters to give us this distance D and solve accordingly for the moment. So the moment is P times 0.226 meters. So we have the moment. Now C, the C value is from the bottom to the neutral axis, which in this case is Y bar itself. So we already have that value, 0 0.026 meters. And all we need to find out is the moment of inertia for the cross section. So use, utilizing the parallel axis theorem and solving for the moment of inertia, um, let's call this cross-sectional area here one and this other one two. So we first solve for the moment of inertia of the first geometry, plus we go ahead and add the cross-sectional area times the distance from the centroid of that geometry to the neutral axis. And do the exact same thing for the other one from the neutral axis of that area to this and then solve. Let's go ahead and do that. And so finally, here are all the values plugged in. Let's go ahead and solve for it. However, one thing to keep in mind, since I'm basing my reference from the bottom to the neutral axis here, one thing to keep in mind, this is where I'm using my base and the height values for these formulas. So that's one thing to keep in mind just to make sure you guys could double check your work. Now, if you're looking at it from this orientation and you're using your base as this bottom value, not sure if that's going to give you accurate results. Most likely not since our reference point is at the this portion of it, right? The, the bottom portion from the neutral axis. So just be careful of what orientation you're looking at the problem and what parameters you're plugging in because you could accidentally choose wrong values for the for the base and height values. So once we calculate that, our moment of inertia value is, so we have 477 times 10 to the negative nine meters to the fourth power. So now that we have all the available information, we have the, the moment equation here, we have the C value, the moment of inertia value, let's go ahead and plug it into the equation. So plug in the values, we have P divided by 0 0.001 meters squared, plus P times 0.226 meter, 0 0.026 divided by a moment of inertia is equal to 180 times 10 to a 3 kilonewtons per meter squared. So keep in mind, just converted the megapascals into kilopascals and went a little bit further and went kilonewtons per meter squared because ultimately our value of P is going to be in kilonewtons. So our meter squared should actually cancel out one thing to keep in mind there. So we get 13,318.66 times P is equal to 180 times 10 to the 3. Um, get P on its own, solve for kilonewtons, and you get your answer for P, which equals to. So we have the maximum P value being equal to 13.51 kilonewtons. Now, going back to solving the maximum axial stress, um, it's either going to be the tension or compression portion of it, but this it's pretty straightforward to determine if the cross-sectional area is symmetric or let's say rectangular. But since we have a T-shaped geometry, it's always good to be able to solve for the, the total stress also considering the compressive component of it because this in fact could determine a lower p-value and that's the one that will govern the design. So let's go ahead and also solve for the compressive stress as well. So essentially the equation stays the same since in this case we have the axial stress positive, compressive stress is de denoted by a negative value, so we're subtracting it. Now the only difference is, is the C value, right? The C value for the tensile stress, we know the bottom portion of the beam was in tension, so C was equivalent to Y bar, but in this case, since 
the top portion is being in compression, we're calculating that this will be the C value to determine, which is nothing more than algebra, right? We have the dimensions, we have Y bar, we could easily solve for it. And C is 0 0.044 here. And let's go ahead and solve for P. And since we're dealing with the compressive stress, right, instead of the 180 times 10 to 3 kilonewtons per meter, since it's not the axial str tensile stress, it's compressive stress, right? We cannot allow the stress exceed 180 megapascals either intention or compression since in this case we're looking at the compression scenario remember to keep that negative sign in mind and solve for p and our maximum p value is 9.06 kilonewton so we see um, we determine the maximum p for it being in tension right here and for it being in compression and we see the lowest value is 9.06 kilonewton and this will govern the design right because if we do 9.06 kilonewtons we're already going to exceed in compression the 180 megapascals but if we keep on going to 13 it's actually going to exceed that for the compressive stress in the material so that's one thing to look out for in this case the lower value is going to be the maximum pressure the maximum force that could be applied